I mean, this is our future. This is our present. This. Mm. Uh, think of the money that's saved. Think of the environmental implications, the flexibility. This is it. This is it. And I'm not saying we need to be 100% online, but we have to take advantage of this. We cannot, as a as a sector, go back to the doldrums. We can't do it. Welcome to the Hydra's Hole with our first guest, Alistair McCarty. An absolute pleasure, Al. Absolute pleasure. My pleasure. So, Al and I, Al and I go back. Uh, a wee way, as he would say. We worked together in Riga between 2016 and 2018. Um, Alistair has a long history in education. He was a maths teacher for eight years, four of those as head of department in a state school in England. He was working at International House Riga as an English teacher, uh, that's in Latvia, for three years. Um, he's been running Al's Action English on YouTube for two years, which is an absolutely fantastic channel if you're interested in learning English. And he's also been working for two years online as a, as a tutor, as an English tutor. So the topic today is online education. Uh, obviously, it's boomed since the start of the quarantine back in March. And there's a lot of debate going on now about what the future could be integrating online education. Um, so we thought we'd start with two periods of strong man. So Al is going to strong man a hard yes for online education. And then I'm going to attempt to strong man a, a hard. So a strong man is to give just one side, the strongest arguments that you can for each extreme. Then after that, let the discussion commence. All right, I'll take it away. So a hard yes for online education, my friend. Hello, everyone. I'd like to, to add it's my pleasure to be the first guest on the Hydra. Try and stick, try and keep me to, uh, to one minute. Mm -hmm. Hard yes for teaching online. Teaching online, gentlemen, isn't the future, it's the present. While all other sectors have been extensively using the power of technology, teaching has been lagging behind in the doldrums. The increased flexibility and worldwide reach are potentially enough on their home to hammer home the point. In 2020, environmental considerations should be at the forefront of every industry. Consider this, less office space, fewer classrooms, less paperwork, less commuting to work. Think of the cost savings. The benefits are at our fingertips. A society becomes ever more concerned with safeguarding a platform which confidentially secures lessons is a safety net for students, parents, unions, ministers, and teachers alike. Arguably, the greatest benefit from a learning perspective is that students have the possibility to review lessons, something that was new to me until recently, to access materials, to analyze errors in detail, to listen to themselves speak again and again, all in one convenient place extending to online records for teachers too. Everything is in place, gentlemen. We simply need to grab hold of it. Mm. Oh, oh yeah. Mic drop. Beautiful. Oh, here you pro. Okay, so uh, before we open up the floor to, to questions, my job is to, to strongman the other side. So a hard no. Um, <clears throat> hard no for online education so uh, online education uh, flies in the face of what is human and what is truly sociable about education um, education is not just about learning facts and figures it's about um, body language full body language it's about understanding other people's energies other people's intentions and unfortunately you can do that through a screen um, let's also not forget that the online education that we're talking about is not available to everybody. Um, think of all of the families who don't have all the screens, uh, the, the Wi-Fi connections, um, the space in their homes. It's simply not viable for the majority of children uh, in the world to, to just switch overnight to online education. Um, there are also so many distractions at home uh, that it's very hard to concentrate. When you go to a place which is, which is dignified, um, uh, which is which is 
quiet, which is focused. Uh, everyone's there focused on the same goal, then it's a completely different atmosphere in which to learn. So um, I think those would be the main points against online education. Uh, that was quite difficult, but it's actually a really good technique for critical thinking, right? So an argument that you don't agree with, you strongman it. We, we, we've gotten this for the sort of the podcast circle that we listen to. You strongman an argument because it makes you see it from the other side. Um, and then you can attack it. You can attack the strongest points and not the weakest. And definitely don't attack the people who say these things. That's an ad hominem uh, logical fallacy. And that is not cool, my friends. So, yeah, good, job. Um, good job, James. I was surprised how well, well you did that, you know, because I knew yeah. you I, know yeah, what, I mean, look, yeah, let's, let's open it up. There are some points on the other side. Let's, let's, be, let's be frank. But, um, yeah, what do you think, guys? Where would we go from here? Um, well, yeah, I didn't even really, even, because like I said, I've been reading your blog, and because I'm not, I don't live in that, that sphere, in that realm, it's not something I think about too much, but I just kind of haven't heard the other side. So, yeah, you did a really good job there of outlining, like you say, about the, about the, the, the point you, you made best, what stood out to me there, was about being focused because there's maybe a lack of focus in home. But mm. I suppose everything you were saying there, I could quickly think of a reason uh, that the online kind of outweighs that. Which, yeah. When you say costs, I mean, I can't think of it off the cuff, but surely there's a cost saving to not having to go to a classroom every day, which would make up for the cost of uh, getting online and then all the other benefits that come with that. Mm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, now, now I'm just speaking as me and I'm not speaking as the avatar for the, for the anti-online uh, mob <laughs> movement. Sorry, sorry. Movement. Good to have you back, James. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, but absolutely. I think everything that I said, there is a solution. And I think the, the last few months have highlighted a lot of problems, which I mentioned, especially in social inequality, which mean that a lot of kids... Uh, and, and adults don't have the access to the education, to the opportunities that they deserve, because education is a fundamental human right. Um, and so how about this? How about all the money that we spend on um, on bombs every year? We can redirect and maybe buy these kids an iPad each, um, you know, like like we buy them books and pens um, and pay for their school school dinners. It's a fundamental right. So it should be a priority for society, I think. Uh, as for Wi-Fi, I mean, there are there are projects in the works, right, to make Wi-Fi universal um, uh, around the world. And until that happens, you can't have a an international uh, online education, uh, of course. Um, where, where are you in this one, Sal? Well, I'd like to ask you a question since you are for online uh, um, courses or classes. And I guess it depends what we're talking about, if you're talking about uh, language classes or if you're generally talking about online classes. So I would ask, would you agree that it's important to have a purpose, uh, why uh, you are teaching online? In a sense, are you doing it because you are constrained to do it because of COVID-19 or mm. because er everybody else is doing it? Are you jumping on a bandwagon or is it actually a purpose why you're doing that? Then also, how is it being done? Is it being done? Are you using tools like Zoom? With uh, potential security risks, and I'm a, I have a strong strong opinions actually against use, the use usage of Zoom for many reasons. From uh, the software back in May, taking secret screenshots of your uh, computer desktop and stuff like that. Yep. Uh, so the tools are uh, very important, and then also the what is being taught. Because one thing is speaking of. Um, language lessons online but the other thing is i always find it funny when for example i see this ads these days tony hawkins teaches skating on masterclass.com skateboarding <laughs> and uh, you know that yeah right so, so yeah uh, the, the graces teach jujitsu online yeah there are certain things you can do so uh, what you would you say like to the why the how and the what how how can Ooh. these things be overcome hang on hang on one question at a time go on out no this is good this is this is <laughs> clean clear thinking that, this is the why you know, the how the what <laughs> this is you know this is why i enjoy enjoy listening to you guys and you know pleasure to be here uh first thing i'll say is uh, teaching english that's i guess that's the what uh so I mostly do that to adults. So that's obviously a different kettle of fish to children. And we'll, James can jump in about that afterwards. Uh, so they are sort of making the decision themselves. And it's primarily one-to-one. -one. 
Mm. Um, I use a platform called Cambly, mm. uh, and they have access to the recordings. Um, I think they're based in Silicon Valley. I'm not 100% sure about their security. Um, the teachers can't access the lessons, but the students can. And it's one of the reasons why it's a huge platform, because students can review their lesson. They can listen to themselves and everything is time stamped. When the teacher said something, when the student said something, when there was a correction typed in the chat box, chat box, mm -hmm. was it a vocabulary? Was it a grammar? Was it a link? And the students absolutely love it. They can review the lesson. And if there was a potential safety issue, I think Cambly can, uh, like can override to check if there was some mm. inappropriate behavior or something. So that's English, which I find it extremely successful. Uh, just briefly, maths, trying to teach maths online, really difficult. Mm. Uh, I don't have as much experience as in the classroom, really difficult. I, I, I'd be interested in why you three I think maths is more difficult to teach online than English as a foreign language. Um, in terms of the why, I mean, this is our future. This is our present. This, mm. uh, think of the money that's saved, think of the environmental implications, the flexibility, this is it, this is it. And I'm not saying we need to be 100% online, but we have to take advantage of this. We mm. cannot, as a, as a sector, go back to the doldrums. We can't do it. Absolutely, we have to take advantage of this opportunity because you don't take advantage of these opportunities and they pass you by. They do. And this is, this is an industry that is stuck in the past. And, it, and it's incredible that even CELTA tutors, I teach this course called CELTA, right? It's, it's for, um, so it's a qualification for English teachers that's recognized around the world and it had to go online in March and a lot of the most uh, famous CELTA tutors around the world were saying no 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 you know it's, it's got no validity it's not real teaching if it's real learning then it's real teaching how is it not real teaching do you think people need to see your shorts in order for it to be real, <laughs> real teaching I just don't understand the arguments and they fall apart in your hands you pick them up and they just disintegrate after one question um so why? Because we do everything else online. Exactly. So why not learn online? You do your shopping online. You date online. You communicate with your family and your friends online. Communication is what language is. So why aren't we communicating, uh, learning a language online? And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't mean to say that all language schools have to close. Um, we need language schools to function. But think of the advantages of having fewer classrooms, less rent to pay. Uh, like I said, all the traveling expenses. Uh, we live in a city, Rome, Sal, that you know what it's like in Rome uh, with the travel. You know, it will save people tons of time. That's more time with, you know, it's more sort of leisure time or time away from <laughs> time off the metro. Um, and then everything that you can see as a disadvantage is a problem. But the solutions are where you look for the solutions. I see these message boards of CELTA tutors, right, just pressing the panic buttons. Have you guys seen the film Ch uh, Chicken Chicken Run? I think yeah. so. Uh, you, know yeah. when the, you know when the chickens panic and they run around? <laughs> that's, what it's, that's what it feels like. I'm like, guys, you, you, you are representatives of this industry of education. And you I mean, press the panic button. But, but look, look, like the security issue. Do you think there's no security issues by teaching a face-to-face -face classroom? Like <laughs> physically, like teaching kids in a, uh, in a classroom. Do you think there's no security issues? It's of a course there thing. are security issues. Uh, yeah, it's different. But I'm saying that what I've seen is in the last few months is a lot of romanticization of the way it used to be before COVID. Oh, I can't wait to get back into the classroom the first week you get back into the classroom you will be full of whinging because guess what that's not perfect either so why don't we modernize and integrate this technology into what we do already because it has fantastic potential yeah mm. um do you think do you think maybe some students would adapt to on online better than other students and how would you kind of account for that if if some people probably need that engage person-to-person -person engagement whereas um 
others don't. I don't know. Would they, could, could you could you do it in a way so that you could I don't know um, keep keep a I suppose you have to keep an eye on grades and see which one was slipping, who was slipping, and who wasn't, and then decide then whether they benefit from more in-person classes. Would that be some sort of way of doing it? There's, there's got to be. This is my view. Strong man's long gone. There's got to be. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, some of the things said were useful, but it's not me. Uh, there's got to be. It's got to be hybrid. Why can't why can't the language school, for example, offer both options? Is that a, is that a fair question? Yeah, absolutely, that's exactly what I'm I'm pushing for right now in you know in my little corner, waving my little flag for hybrid education because the world is hybrid, whether you like it or not or not, the world is hybrid. So education should reflect that because what you're doing with education, you're preparing people for the world, right? This is not an abstract thing. But we're not. That's, education does not prepare people for the world. That's At the, the moment, problem. it doesn't. That's yeah. the problem. Yeah. But it's it's a hybrid world. And, and really, I don't see why with all the advantages and now all these teachers with tons of experience, people are glorifying going back to full time face to face teaching. And I'm sad for them. And I think it's a wasted opportunity for them and for their students. Um, so, yeah, I'm also pushing for a hybrid model where like you said, then, there are people that need to learn face-to-face and, and education should cater for them as well. There are other people that would learn better online. There are other people that would, would do really well on a sort of a 50-50 model or a 60-40 model either way or a 70-30, you know, to have maybe one week's lesson in the classroom, one week online. So they just have to travel into the physical school every two weeks instead of every week. There are many different options, but just to throw this away in the bin because, oh, my goodness, we survived the COVID quarantine and now we can get back to normal, whatever normal is. What if normal wasn't all that it could have been? How about that? What if normal could have been better? Are we just going to pass up this opportunity now? For me, it's very sad. But I'm also hopeful that that, that a lot of teaching professionals are not just going to turn a blind eye to all the, all the benefits of online teaching and uh, we can integrate it as an industry. That's something we touched on earlier is it's highlighted uh, issues of social mobility. Um, I think the number in the UK is somewhere between 25 and 30 percent, uh, the gap between uh, those from a well-off and the less well-off. And that is a statistically significant figure. And mm. we should be thankful that, you know, this period, which has been difficult, has highlighted this. And that should be fed back to governments, to councils. And education has potentially raised the issue. We all know it's there, but it's highlighted it even more. Yeah. We've, we've, got to, we've got to use it. We've got to use this opportunity. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. Because one way of looking at this situation is saying, Oh, you know, it's really unfair on, on these kids from, you know, poorer families. They don't have these opportunities. Oh, yeah, we should all go back to the classroom. When they go home at four o'clock and they don't have these opportunities to study because they can't concentrate on what they're doing, they don't have the technology, they don't have the space. They don't have, do, do, you, do you think that's still a fair system? Like the system that some, that some kids get all the chances and other kids get the peanuts is not fair and it's been highlighted. So instead of saying, oh, let's go back to normal because it's not fair on these kids, no, 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 you're missing the point completely. It shined a light on something which is glaringly problematic, right? And now you need to do something about the problem. The problem is not going to change by going back to face to face. The problem is still there. You need to actually help these kids in a deeper way. And that means serious, uh, serious change in, in the structure of, um, and I'm not saying rip, rip up the system, I'm saying um, helping them with educational tools, like I said before, laptops, tablets, uh, how's their Wi-Fi connection, um, things like this, uh, spaces that they can work in outside of school, you know, how's your library system, How, how's your sort of your community spaces, you know, in your neighbourhood. Things like this. Uh, this is what we need now because it's been highlighted. Not to go back to the way things work because you're not solving any problems like that. Could I could I put out a question? Um, sure. Specifically for for younger children, how 
how best can we engage younger children in learning in the absence of physical play, of physical yeah, interaction? Sorry. That's a big sorry, question. Sorry, you did, yeah, you did mention that earlier, and um, I forgot to pick up the uh, the leash on that. It's okay. Um, yeah, I think f- for kids, and this is why it's never a black and white issue. Um, for kids, I would argue for a lot more in this hybrid world of education. I would, I would, ar- I would argue for a lot higher percentage of physical uh, classroom because they need to learn to socialize with other children. They need to learn about body language. I'm talking about whole body language, not just now. I agree. Uh, I've, I've been stroking my <laughs> knee. I've been stroking my knee for the last 15 minutes, and you haven't seen. <laughs> but um, no, for, for kids, the the, the physical, the physicality of eye contact, of 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 respect, of sitting still in a place is very important. What you can do online, um, and a lot of teachers have have been lacking on this, I think, because the the webinars that I've given. Um, have come as a surprise to a lot of people, which I'm, I'm glad to help, of course, but the, the, the lack of movement in the online environment is very, very um, uh, problematic for, for especially younger kids. There are ways, there are activities that you can do to get kids moving around. You have to be a bit more creative, but they are there. But of course, I would argue once we can safely go back, which is probably a, a completely different discussion, once it is 100% safe to go back, or at least 95, I don't know, um, to, a, to a physical classroom, to a physical school, then yeah, I think the younger the child, the more likely it should be that they go back to the physical space. The older the person, though, why do you need to learn in the physical space all the time? uh for me it's not clear i mean Al, you have you have you have students all over the world right yes mm-hmm. but where do you where do you teach at the moment i mean you teach from northern ireland but where where, where do you try yeah just, just to just to sort of paint a picture of the flexibility and the worldwide reach which is exciting it's part of the reason why i have a youtube channel as well uh, so east asia brazil Turkey and the Middle East are the three main areas or countries for me. Brilliant. Uh, and it's timing, it's just, it's just a treat. Uh, yeah. And we didn't even get onto, you know, mental health for, you know, for teachers as well. Yeah. Um, you know, teachers, I think when a lot of teachers, certainly in the physical classroom in the UK, get to a certain age, it becomes a burden. Mm-hmm. You've been doing it for 40 years. As to some teachers on the platform that I use that are 65, 70, 75, and they clock up some hours because their their experience in teaching English is vast, and the platform permits them to do it. Do you do you I find online teaching do you find online teaching less stressful than going to the physical space? Uh, yes. Yeah. No, I would agree on that, but I've seen a lot of comments on these pages saying oh it's awful but that's like oh <laughs> even my 10 minute commute i think i'm gonna die about five times a day <laughs> on, on the bike in rome i find it a lot less stressful i've got, I've got coffee on tap I, I sit in my shorts all day i just need to make sure i'm dressed from here up sometimes i, I roll my shirt up because it's hot here in the summer um but like you say it's a fantastic opportunity for intercultural communication that we wouldn't have in a physical space i'm running a course called brain and game this august and so far, I have kids from Russia, I have kids from Hungary, and I have kids from Spain, and I have kids from Italy on this course, right? That's and they're incredible. all going to communicate each other. For, they're going to communicate with each other for a full week, and they're going to break down a lot of barriers and a lot of preconceptions that they had. Would this be possible in the in the physical space? Possible, yes. Likely, absolutely no. not. So look at the opportunities and and make the most of them. I would say. So you're you're very pensive down there. I know that you have a lot of tech tools. Tell us what's wrong with Zoom, because I mean Zoom's the go-to around the world. What's, what's no the Zoom? Issue? I just is uh, <laughs> bad bad news, but it's for a whole different podcast. But um, one I look other thing, to it. one other thing I want to talk about quickly, because uh, you were talking about uh, kids before, and it's, it's one of the risks I see, and I agree that uh, young kids, especially, uh, should have that physical contact and that uh, um, instant feedback so that they learn how to behave to other human beings. I think that's a healthy thing, not only since Jonathan Haidt uh, wrote his book. But the other thing, uh, the other risk I see is um, that people use these 
chances, these tools we have now in such a bad way that people are going to be put off by this whole opportunity and the online world. And they say, see, I told you this is all crap. Let's go back to the old ways. Because sometimes it's just a lack of skills and expertise. And so people rather do it uh, uh, bad just to do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas they don't do it in the right way. So that's one uh, big risk I see. And the other one is, and this is actually a question for our guest. Do you think that um, there are chances in recorded lessons in the sense, I mean, there are linear mm. versus um, face-to-face classes. What, because one thing that you said before, people record their classes. That reminds me of university when I used to secretly tape um, lectures. <laughs> which was great to uh, listen at, at home again, you know, especially some parts, some concepts, listen over and over again. Yeah. Um, but, but I suppose, I suppose so. that's, that's what the YouTube <clears throat> channel is, right? They're recorded lessons of sorts. Yeah, so, but sorry, I'm Al. thinking yeah. more like uh, elaborate courses. Like, for example, there are a lot of courses of Stanford University and Harvard about all kinds of topics from machine learning to whatever you want, mm-hmm. uh, all for free or, or, or you pay and you get a certificate. So do you think that's something that's... Um, in your field, especially uh, teaching language, is that something that's viable or can it just be complementary to what you already do face to face? That is a cracker of a question. That's That's got to be a podcast. That's a cracker. Uh, that right. is an absolute cracker. I, I genuinely never considered it. My instinct is, so I don't want to, I need to think about it a bit. My instinct is for language acquisition, a set course that you follow by yourself perhaps isn't the best way that would be my instinct but i'd need to think about that more mm-hmm. um, that's my instinct all right i would say so that language learning a language is about interaction and it's about adapting what you're doing to the student in front of you mm. and i don't mean physically in front of you because i feel that you're in front of me now you you three right we're interacting and i'm adapting my speech to to what you guys are saying I don't think you can program a person to no. use a language like a robot. I think there needs to be this emotional connection. And this is one of the things that people get wrong about online teaching. They say, oh, you can't get an emotional connection online. Yes, you can. Maybe mm-hmm. you're doing it wrong. Maybe you need to change some of your practices, but you definitely can. Um, but, yeah, I think there needs to be this interaction and this um, connection. I don't see... I see what you're saying, and I and I see the potential there to actually monetize it, right? Because I can make one series of lessons, and 20 million people could watch it. Yep. But you can I can't scale, be with 20 million people it, in yeah. the class. <laughs> exactly. The this is the problem is... with education. That you can't usually scale education in in the um, synchronous format. That's that's one of the issues. I mean, but Al and I are not in this game to get rich. That's for sure. Because what you're doing is basically like homeschooling in a way. It's like an uh... A non-scalable alternative and very um, personalized form of teaching, right? But it, uh, teaching without being personalized is teaching. Like, I agree. It's, it's not. It's not a money game. Like this is. This is. This is not about money for us. Mm. We we need to pay our bills, but this is not the priority. Once you once you make teaching robotic, I'm out. Mm. I'm not interested anymore. Do you know how much I learn from my students? I learn a lot. I feel like I'm learning every day as well. Mm. Maybe not English, but I have this morning at 8 a.m. I had a lesson with, with two Russian guys. One of them's in Bali. One of them's in Moscow. They're both IT experts. I learn a lot from them mm. about life, about their philosophy, about their travels. So I wouldn't want to just record myself and be a robot because I would be in an office by now if I was interested in that kind of work. I think maybe as far as the, the practicalities of what Sal's asking is that you could learn things on a basic level in that way, off a recorded, off a, off a one a one size fits all lesson. But maybe to get into the, to but the, you can you you can learn things like Al. I, I learn a lot from your YouTube. I, I send your YouTube videos to to my students, right? And you're not there with them. You can learn things. That's for sure. Well, what, what, how do you see that? But you wouldn't your YouTube, your YouTube is asynchronous, right? And there's a lot of useful yeah, lessons yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, but it's no, they're not. I want to use the word replacement. They're not a replacement for yeah. for lessons. I, I'm not here to advertise, but I would have a you know a, a call I to am. action. Owls, owls <laughs> action English. Owls action English. <laughs> So I would have a call to action to, you know, to watch another video or 
to contact me for a lesson or for accent coaching is where I get most of my business, if you want to call it that, through YouTube. Because um, if you want, if you want to, you know, to really learn, you know, come and interact with me. Uh, mm. So yeah, interaction you, is how do you one. see your YouTube channel, Owls Action English? Do you see it as a gateway into lessons? Do you see it as like a, a something something interesting for you personally? How do you sort of um, place it on your on your on your table? I suppose. Yeah, no, good good question. As a personal goal, I wanted to you know test myself, learn some new skills because I'm I was completely inept uh, technology wise. So I wanted to learn some skills, uh, committed to two years, whilst also potentially attract people uh, for English lessons. But as I say, it's normally people who want the Northern Irish accent. That's like 95% of the contacts, the emails, are nothing to do with English language, which is sort of YouTube does crazy things, but uh, that's the game. Uh, so a bit of everything, personal and, you know, to help other people. But I just put out things that interest me generally. Mm-hmm. I think we can all learn from your, um, how should we call it, your, your mantra of, of, of saying that we should all speak with clarity, honesty, and accuracy. Clarity, honesty, accuracy, I think. <laughs> if Amen. you strip, strip it all back, it will be a lot better world if, if everybody took that on board. So thank you for that, Al. There's a lot of great stuff on there. I'm not, I'm, I'm not advertising it because you're my friend. I'm advertising it because it's great. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Al. Honestly, it was a real, a real honour to have you on with us, and thank you for all your interesting ideas, and thanks for your work, man. Because, um, I mean, just on a personal level, sometimes I get discouraged, to be honest with you, with the industry in general. Um, and then, you know, to go back to your videos to chat to you about certain issues, um, I feel that that there's that I'm not alone. You know, I'm not going crazy in my own little corner. That that, that there is progress to be made, and and we're doing it. So keep going the feeling is mutual your blog inspires me <laughs> namaste to that mm-hmm. cheers guys mm-hmm. Thanks, Thanks, Paul. peace out everyone why are we making these podcasts because three heads are better than one we'll combine our experiences and research on engaging topics to learn a bit more each time enjoy the chat and improve our own communication skills in the process. Innovation comes from the ability to correlate information between different realms of knowledge and we all have very different realms of knowledge between the three of us. Why the Hydra you ask? In archetypal mythology, dragons guard piles of gold. Overcoming fears can bring great rewards. What you most need is often where you least want to look and we won't shy away from the fire to challenge each other and reach that goal. What's in it for you, listener? Learn, laugh and love. Get involved and join us on this adventure.